introduction, Keith. And actually, today I am not going to talk so much about science, but actually I'm going to talk about people. And there's going to be a bit of love within the room and then a bit of hate. And I'm going to talk about the actual duplicity within what do we think, how does that relate to science, and what do we want, and then when can we use science. And it came, the actual what do we want theme of the talk actually came out of last night talking to lots of different people and we were talking about lots of different things within um, the management of water and how it's used in floodplains, etc, etc, etc. And then we kept coming down to this question, what do we as humans, what do we want? And how does that then feed on all down the line? And that's what I'm going to talk about today, um, about that social systems and ecological systems are intrinsically linked and you can't actually pull them apart. And a little bit about my <coughs> journey was that I started as a research scientist, I would say, and uh, Paul Humphreys was actually very instrumental in helping me to learn about how fish swim, um, what they get up to, uh, what birds do, whatever else. And then when I went out into the real world, I was actually very frustrated that there was all this good science around and it wasn't being used. So it was back to the school for me and I studied management within my masters. I came out, I would say, probably even more frustrated that management was being influenced by such political pressures or things like that and that scientists weren't, managers weren't using scientists uh, information and things like that. So I said, right, what do I do? I go back to school. <laughs> Down a bit, yeah. So I went back to school, into my PhD, and there I really studied science, management, psychology, and you would say philosophy. And where did it leave me? <laughs> Conflicted, I would say. I think that was my major state of mind and I'm probably in some serious need of some uh, psychological treatment myself. <laughs> but out of all of that, what it came down to that, that was that people were important within any ecological system and that we had to work at that level, at least from my perspective um, of what we were. So I became not a scientist, not a manager, definitely not a psychologist. And where did it leave me? And I guess that's a little bit mistrusted by all. And that's probably not a bad thing to be in the level of what I do. And I would say almost my main role now is actually about facilitation of people to meet ec some ecological outcomes. Along the way, I was lucky enough to work with people um, out of Europe, because I spent a sort of 10-year journey, you might say, travelling around the world. Work with people out of uh, Europe, out of the USA, Africa, New Zealand, lots of different places. And the, the thinking had come along that effective conservation planning was actually a social process that was informed by science, but it wasn't a scientific process. And as a scientist, that's really, really hard in some ways to take. Um, and that actual thinking came out of two of the largest protected areas in the world. Kruger National Park in South Africa had very much a command and control style of management where they didn't, they wanted it to be about animals and all of these things and weren't actually inclusive of what was actually also within their parks. Yet their rhino populations, all of these other things started, were continuing to decline. And what they realised was that one of the major things they'd have to concentrate on, even though it was about natural resource management or effective conservation management, was poverty alleviation. And since the 90s, that's their main, one of their major focuses as opposed to how much water do we put in a river, different things like that. Um, if you look at Yellowstone, the birthplace of, of national parks in a way, John Muir, the whole works, was actually that they realised that their reintroduction schemes for their uh, bears and for their wolves would be wholly dependent on all the hicks that lived around the park, who all had shotguns, loved to go hunting, and what they would do, they would harvest elk and deer from around the park, and all of the wolves and the bears would move out of the park to eat the carcasses or the guts that were left after the, after the shooting, 
And what do people do when they see wolves and bears running around on your place? That's why they're extinct in 51 states of America. Well, not actually, no, it's 48 now. I think they call it the top 48. And that they realised they would have to engage with these landholders outside through education and all of these other things, all of these people things, to actually get those conservation strategies they're putting on in place of their park to work. Now, where am I? Is that actually working? Yep, so here we go. That's us, in a way, the policy makers, the scientists, all of these heartless, faceless people <laughs> trying to look at effective conservation management in many ways as a, a cold process that doesn't involve humans. Then you have the lovely community. I mean, how can you exclude them? Have a look at them. They're all happy. They're all dealing with each other. And that actually, my point there being that these social processes within ecological thinking is actually really, really important. And that you will look at duplicity and you will have conundrums through all of your ecological management. The classic example of one of them is we stock trout in the lower sections of rivers so people can go and catch them. We poison them in the upper sections to protect a galaxid or something else like that. Is that right? Like, if you think of that from a scientific point of view, that sounds like madness. From a social ecological perspective, you're meeting the needs of two groups of people or two different thinkings or two different philosophies. So is that a good outcome? I'm not here to actually say anything profound today either, by the way. I'm <laughs> Shut up, Wayne. <laughs> uh, Wayne may, when he presents the science of the project, and Rex, you can shut up too, that's my brother. Um, I'm actually here just to provide another perspective and to get some thinking uh, outside of what may be your normal sort of realm of thinking. And I think one of the aspects of when we start to classify systems and we look at health within the system, uh, in general you would say that that this is your healthy system and this is your unhealthy system. But when I actually look at that, at least from my perspective as an ecologist, I actually see those as both healthy transitional stages within a boom and bust uh, natural environment of Australia. And I think, Sean, when you presented uh, yesterday, I'm not sure if he's here, I think he showed the real, uh, when it was about condition assessments with trees within it, and you had you had that this was all really good and this was all really bad and we wanted to avoid this for however percentage of the time. But when you looked at the ecological indicator that they used, which was a little bird, little tree creeper, like to jump around, it was associated with two transitional stages within this. It was associated with wanting this so he could run around and eat all his food and that, but he actually needed dead trees to live in. So what are we managing for? Or are we actually out managing ourselves out of a system? I'm not saying that too much of the system doesn't look like this and that it's not it been a 90% reduction in floodplain and all of these other things. It's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, depending on how we use the science or use whatever within our management, we'll have actions that lead to reactions as well. <clears throat> so the Edward Wall Cool System, so looking at it from the system's perspective, we have Barma Miller were here. And the social ecological aspects, or at least the systems type thinking that I, in my philosophy, think is the correct way to go. And hopefully, I forgot to say that I'm also a bit of a salesman, so we'll see how we go by the, by the end of the talk. That these are all interlinked together, and we see these either, either as food sources for the river downstream, or carp breeding areas, depending on who you talk to, and that, that that's what we're talking about and what Sarah was talking about in that whole of systems thinking, that all of these things are interlinked and so we should look to manage, whether we look to manage discreetly or we look to manage in that overview. Looking at a system like the Edward War Cool, and getting back to that human perspective of what do we want, you've got many, many different stakeholder groups. And usually in talks you put an acknowledgement in and if I was to actually look at uh, 
acknowledging my partners, this is actually the, the whole stakeholder base that I have to look at. I would also say that they're actually been very much the bane of my life for the last four years as well. Uh, interrupted many of my fishing trips due to all of these work commitments that have been forced upon me due to these groups. So within all of those stakeholder groups, of course, they all get along. <laughs> then you start to look at saying, okay, if we're looking at environmental water instance, running that through the system, how does that work? And of course, that's really simplistic. And there's not a lot to consider within that. And I'm not even going to talk about the Victorians. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so how do you make some sense out of that madness in a way? And, and there were some really good talks yesterday on strategic adaptive management or adaptive management and things like that. And that that's these planning processes you go through. And one of the big things I would say we're famous for in this part of Australia actually is adaptive management. And I think we're really, really good at this, what you might call the technical aspects of adaptive management. And sometimes we're very much failing at this, this top area of stakeholder engagement, creating shared visions and all of these things. And that actually until you work out all of this human fuzziness type stuff, you can't actually go on into science. And my, my statement there that humans are meerkats I really like meerkats and I really like humans and I like studying both of them. And if you think about it, meerkats spend 90% of their time fighting each other, as we talk about. But if actually you give them something in front, such as an enemy, they band together and they work extremely hard to kick their ass. Humans are very similar in that sense that if you create a common vision and a common goal, you don't have to get along to get to the end point. And that shared vision planning or strategic adaptive management, that adaptive man management planning side is very much related to that. And that comes down to actually what do humans value before you even start to talk about the science. So the values within the ecological systems, lots of ecological values, fish, birds, frogs, all of these great things. So we start to look at, okay, how do we manage that? But how does that relate to the value of production? <clears throat> Rice production within this system feeds 30 million people every day. Is that a value that you look to maintain? <clears throat> also, one gigalitre of water is worth half a million dollars to a rice farmer, which inputs to the economy and that feeds back to here and there and everywhere else. So social ecological thinking, considering that. You've got those cultural values. The horse one, I was cracking up about that one. Because it was like, how do we allow horses into an ecological zone such as the farmer? You know why? Because of my dad and he liked driving. And that's social implications within that. That doesn't necessarily mean ecologically that's acceptable or whatever. But all of those stakeholders, although all those things have opinions and political push and all of these things, and that's why horses are still in the farmer and haven't all been shot. I actually, when you talked about, Keith, and you talked about that they were linked to the, to the mora grass plains, I thought, maybe a control strategist, because I was thinking as, you know, as a manager, maybe if we want to get rid of horses, we'll burn all the mora grass, and then they'll all starve to death. <laughs> that could work. Anyway, recreation is another really, really important one. The conflicting issue here sometimes with the ecological water, as with the cultural stuff is, that we're going to use ecological water to grow big Murray cod so my good looking brother can go off and catch them recreationally or the other way around that all of the reasons or all the ways that we use ecological water or, or flooding or things like that actually add to recreational values. Yet we never ever discuss this usually within ecological sense. You will see it done in the USA all the time. They have recreational and ecological flows and they combine them to maximise the production through the canyons so that you can get salmon it's moving through but also so that guys can jump in their tubes and run off down the canyons and drink lots of beers while they're doing it, usually out of Colorado. Depending on how you run your flows will affect each parts of these systems. So I haven't even got to science and I've already taken it up 
all of my talking time. So fortunately, the science is actually going to be presented by someone else. So it was actually about if we've got to combine all of this stuff for humans into a plan where we're looking for ecological outcomes, how do we do it? And that's that shared vision planning stuff that's right at the top before you even get to science. And it was about people basically wanted native fish in the system. This is what they came up with. It fitted within legislative requirements. It's a good indicator of ecological health, depending on who you talk to. People choose indicators because they like them as opposed to whether they're actually good ecological indicators. But they still wanted to produce rice and food and all of these things. So this was the vision that was come up in the system. You know the other funny thing about it is, how many social scientists are in this room today? Talking about natural resource management and social processes being intrinsically linked to ecological processes and everything like that, and I bet we're all, well, uh, not me, because I don't know what I am anymore, <laughs> but I bet most of you are actually naturally based scientists. And when I started this process, I couldn't find a social scientist and I couldn't find one that would actually speak to me because they all think that we have animal afflictions and uh, yeah, relate to different terms. And you know what I used to actually do this was a, was a method called conflict mapping, um, which is a social science tool and it's used within conflict resolution or it's used actually within warmongering is the other thing. And I used that to get all of these groups that were opposed to each other to come up with a sort of single vision type thing and that um, to get that so to now we talk about the science you want self-sustaining populations of native fish you need to determine the recruitment patterns of the native fish within the system you need to consider that within the third party uh, impacts or considerations as we call them and it needs to be partnership driven that all people are involved all the time I'm not going to go any further than that I'm going to leave that and I'm going to let Wayno actually show you how we went about producing the science that would then feed back into this vision setting or this aspirational setting. And I'll, my introduction, <laughs> introduction to Wayne would be that when we started to formulate all the science of this, that the group was set up so we had all these fish botherers sitting around once we'd come up with the, with the soft and fuzzy stuff. And I would whinge as a manager about what I wanted. The fish biologists would tell me that it couldn't be done. I would tell them to reduce their complexity into simplicity, otherwise I wasn't going to pay them. Then we would come up with a plan, then we would ask our biometrician, is this actually going to work? And he would say no, and then it would go all around again. And that went on for about two days. And we actually, I know he's called a biometrician, but we actually call him the biomagician because all of the things that he comes up with, no one knows how he gets there, but they're, <laughs> co but they're cool as. And so, with further ado, I guess we'll have yeah, Wayne Robinson come up and talk about uh, the actual science that was put behind this process, and also that uh, yeah, Wayne's from uh, Charles Sturt University slash Fisheries, New South Wales DPI.